Ulcerative colitis is a relapsing and remitting inflammation disorder of the colonic mucosa. And this results due to a combination of genetic susceptibility of the patient and abnormal gut flora, which causes inappropriate inflammation. And as a result, there are ulcers in the mucosa, there may or may not be pseudopolyps, and it causes hyperemic and hemorrhagic mucosa. The associated factors are interesting because smoking is protective, getting an appendicectomy is a protective, and HLA-DR103 gene is thought to be the main culprit behind this. Factors that provoke a relapse are emotional stress, intercurrent infections, gastroenteritis, and antibiotics and NSAIDs. And since ulcerative colitis means there's only colonic involvement, Incidental findings show that proctitis occurs in 30% of the patients, left-sided colitis in 40% of the patients, and pancolitis in 30% of the patients. And pancolitis particularly is important as that is the one which results in pseudopolyps forming. Now, how will the patient present to you in a clinical setting? They will have rectal bleeding, bloody diarrhea. They'll complain of urgency and abdominal cramps. They'll have general symptoms like fever, malaise, and anorexia, and they'll show weight loss. Now, there are a lot of extra-intestinal signs that can be seen with patients of ulcerative colitis, like clubbing, aphthous ulcers, erythema nodosum and pyoderma gangrenosum. They'll have conjunctivitis, episcleritis, and iritis. They'll show large joint arthritis, sacroiliitis ankylosing spondylitis, and primary sclerosing cholangitis, along with some nutritional deficits since the patient isn't eating right. You can remember all of these by grouping them into skin changes, eye changes, and a weirdly drawn joint changes. Now if this goes untreated, it may complicate into acute and chronic problems like toxic dilation, hypokalemia, and venous thromboembolism, and eventually they'll form colonic cancer. When diagnosing such a patient, we do the blood test like full blood count and erythrocyte sedimentation, C-reactive protein, urea, electrolytes, liver function tests, and cultures. We do a stool culture to rule out Campylobacter, C. difficile, and Salmonella and Shigella, along with amoebiasis. Then there's the fecal calprotectin, which is a non-invasive test that shows GI inflammation. Then we go on to the abdominal x-ray, which will show no fecal shadows, mucosal thickening, as well as colonic dilatation. We do the lower GI endoscopy, in which in an acute attack patient, we do a limited flexible sigmoidoscopy, then control the disease, then move on to a full colonoscopy. An easy way to remember all of this is we check the blood, we check the poop, and then we try to see the inflammation within the patient. When assessing the disease, we use the true love and wits criteria. I'll add the link of the detailed image in the description. The headings of it are motions per day, rectal bleeding, resting pulse, hemoglobin, temperature, ESR, and CRP. And how I like to remember it is that I imagine true love and wits used to be roommates. And true love used to say that wits has ulcerative colitis, which is why my roommate really hates to eat corn. We manage the patient based on the severity of the disease. Now, in case of active protitis, we give 1 gram mesalazine suppositories, 5 aminosalicylates or pentasa, topical steroids are given, systemic glucocorticoids are given, and stool softeners are given. In mild to moderate cases, we give a daily dose of oral and topical 5-ASA. The topical is withdrawn after one month, whereas the oral 5-ASA is necessary to prevent relapses and risk of dysplasia. Now, this is known as the top and tail approach. If even after two to four weeks, there's no response, we start adding steroids, which are tapered by 5 mg per week for eight weeks. If the patient is resistant, we start immunosuppression and along with all of this, we give calcium and vitamin D supplements to prevent bone resorption. In cases of severe ulcerative colitis, the patient needs to be hospitalized and we give IV methylprednisolone or hydrocortisone 
At this point, oral or topical has no role. If even after 30 days, the patient fails to show response, we start immunomodulation through cyclosporin and infliximab, and this is only to avoid an urgent colectomy. If the patient does go into remission, we give a daily oral 5-ASA. If the patient relapses, then we give azathioprine or 6 per capita purine. If the patient is intolerant to these, we start with anti-TNF antibodies like infliximab and adalimumab. Or we can go towards anti-alpha-4-B7 antibodies, which include vidalizumab. 